right, it looks like we are indeed live. All right, half a day, half a day. My name is Michael Luhan Bavakwa, and I am excited to be, to be uh, opening today's Hita Talk. Uh, I am the curator at the Guam Museum. Uh, one of the things that the Guam Museum has done over the years is that we organize Hita Talks. We have not had one for a few years because of the pandemic. And so I'm very excited that today we are bringing you the first Hita Talk in more than two years. Um, our presentation today will be from author, hiking enthusiast, Dave Lotz, who will be presenting Searching for the People of Magua. But before we get into that, I wanted to invite the president of the Department of Chamorro Affairs, um, which uh, is the agency which oversees the Guam Museum. If, uh, if Melvin could please sort of just uh, open up today's events and talk about sort of what, what lies ahead for the future for the museum. Afede, Guawasi, Melvin, Wampat, Borja. Thank you, uh, Miguel and uh, Dave for being here and coordinating this uh, relaunch. Uh, the Guam Museum is not just about showcasing the past, but we are also here to help the community engage in conversation about things that matter to us today. A museum is not just a display of artifacts of the past, it also helps bridge the past, present, and future. Uh, this is our mission, our mandate to the community, and although the pandemic has made it necessary to evolve and adapt, we are committed to meeting it. In uh, 2022, the Guam Museum is looking forward to fully reopening to the public and relaunching our list of regularly uh, regular community activities and hopefully adding some new ones along the way. Uh, the Hita Talks, uh, albeit still virtual, represent one of these steps. We plan to hold one every month, and as the COVID situation permits, look forward to holding them once again in person in our beautiful Guam Museum Theater facility. The Hita Talks are where we respond to public questions about challenges our island is facing and also highlight amazing work that artists, activists, scholars, and many others are doing in the community. I want to say to Duas Maasi in particular, to our Guam Museum Administrator, Leona Young, who has been guiding the museum through this pandemic and now working tire tirelessly to navigate us out of it. Her and our Guam Museum Curator, Dr. Michael Luhan Bavakwa, have put in a lot of work to put together an amazing list of potential presenters this year for our Hita Talk series. But over the next few months, we will be on the lookout for more information, on, or please be on the lookout for more information on our relaunching Ha'an and Familia, for our family day activities. Our Guam Museum Foundation has also been re reconstituted and is working to get our cafe and gift shop open. 2022 is looking bright for the Guam Museum and we hope to see you there this year, either virtually or in person. Next week is the start of Mess Tomorrow. And remember that one of the best ways to celebrate this time is to stop by the Guam Museum. We are open for visits for our Hina Alta exhibit, which is our permanent exhibit, Tuesdays to Fridays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Again, Suzuus Masi to uh, Dr. Bavakwa and Mr. Dave Lotz for coordinating and launching this first uh, reopening of the Hita Talks. Thank you for those of you who are viewing live online and we look forward to seeing more of you view the archive of these talks and future talks as well. Suzuus Masi, thank you again, Maget, uh, Mr. Dave Lotz and best of luck to both of you. Suzuus Masi, Melvin, Suzuus Masi. And so, Let's move right into today's Heat the Talk, because I'm, I personally, I'm feeling very excited about this, because um, today we're going to be talking about a place called Magua. And so many of you may not be familiar with Magua. Um, and so this was a place which um, has been around since ancient times. Um, it's a place where families, several dozen families lived prior to World War II and right after the war. But it became sort of a controversial location when in, two, in 20, uh, 2018, it was discovered that after artifacts and signs of life had been discovered there, that the US military had went ahead and bulldozed the site. As in the words of the state historic preservation officer at that time, they had, uh, they, it was like they were trying to erase it from the earth. And so Magua uh, came into consciousness on social media. Um, with images shared of the area before and then after sort of the, the construction had taken place. So in 2018, there was a demonstration across the street from the entrance to Nick Tams, the Naval Communications and tele, tele, the Naval uh, 
the Navy base up there. And so more than 100 people showed up um, to sort of show their support for the site, to call on the US military to, uh, to halt or pause or slow down their military construction because it was leading to unknown sites uh, which, which held great significance, cultural significance, historical significance for the Chamorro people that unknown number of sites might be lost in the process if due diligence wasn't done in assessing these areas, collecting the artifacts and understanding how they're connected to the, to the lives of ancient Chamorros and also the lives of some of our grandparents and our great grandparents who may have lived in that area. And so I'm very excited today to be joy uh, that Dave Lotz, a his historian, uh, an author, uh, a hiking enthusiast. Many of you may have been on hikes with him. Um, many of you may have been introduced to the beauty of Guam uh, on hikes with him or the Booney Stompers. He's written several books on hiking and including some that you may not have heard about. He's got one on uh, US submarines in sort of the, in the Pacific, which you can get on Amazon. And so I'm thankful that he is here today to share with us his research where after finding out about the, the area of Magua, he sort of took on an investigation wanting to learn as much about the people uh, and the life of this area called Magua. And so Dave, Sidus Masi again, uh, for, for being sort of the presenter for our first relaunched Hita talk of 2022. Well, thank you. Uh, I really feel honored to be here I do want to thank uh, Melvin and Michael for uh, this opportunity. Uh, Maga was relatively unknown to our, the current uh, residents of the island until this information, as Michael has eloquently presented, became more and more known. I've taken a bit of a personal interest in this, both professionally and personally. The irony of this is when I first came to Guam in 1950, I was up at uh, what was then called Naval Communications Station Guam. So uh, at that time and until very recently, little was known, certainly military personnel at the base were virtually ignorant on the rich uh, Chamorro heritage of Mangua. Well, let's move on to the slides. I hope to cover quite a bit uh, that is there. I know that uh, Michael will allow ample time at the end for questions if there are people who feel they have points of information, if they feel I, I have more information to share, which I do. But let's take a look at this. Magua is a story of two villages and two times. Those times are defined by Western contact, have nothing to do with what was happening on the island but the Western contact created a great disruption on Guam. I have a quote here that I think is essential to what we're talking about. A concerned effort to preserve our heritage is a vital link to our cultural, educational, aesthetic, inspirational, and economic legacies. All of the things that quite literally make us who we are. Keep that as a thought. Perhaps most of you already have that concept because you were very concerned about preserving the Chamorro heritage on our island. Let's move on. And I'm going to be spending a fair amount of time looking at some maps because maps are quite revealing. Magua is initially recorded by the Spanish in this map of 1676. You notice the style of mapping and the style of uh, printing names is considerably different than what we use today. You'll also notice the very prominent use of the Christian cross, which was considerably important to the Spanish, noting areas that they considered represented where uh, perhaps uh, churches or missions were located. Magua has the spelling I've used at the top on this, it's basically in the center of the uh, map we have here. And this is only a portion of a much larger map of Guam. That is the initial map, uh, basically a Western map, Spanish of Magua. 
But now let's take this concept of this map and move on to the next slide. I am very fortunate and appreciative that I can use this by Kelly Marsh and Jolie Liston in their book, Laddie and the Marianas. If you haven't received this book, please put an order in because there's quite a revealing overall map of the island uh, compiled by uh, David and uh, his wife, MJ, and I. it is very revealing to indicate connections of trails and habitation sites. More attention should be paid, and I think we will have that coming out of MAGA at one time, oh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. It was deemed that only habitation sites were along the coastal areas. That is basically incorrect. So take a look at MAGA in the center here again. Primary routes of, uh, of travel are in the black lines. The uh, red is the secondary. Obvious places that we know about are listed there, Hinopsin, Retidian, Uruno, Haputo, and uh, many other places that need further examination. So now let's, let's continue on. We're dealing with the uh, initial village of, of Magua. And these are a couple photos I took prior to the destruction that shows the Laddie Stone and Pottery Shirts. And these no longer exist in this location. And I'm uncertain as to what has happened as far as those actual Pottery Shirts. Uh, this is, uh, the information on this is also shared in a publication that may have been produced by or for the Navy a couple of years ago. And at least it revealed some time frames of uh, a limited amount of carbon testing that spans from the periods in the 1300s up to the 1800s. So at least we have some scientific data of contact and recordation and habitation from that time frame. And I'm, I'm going to be moving on. Let's take a look at the next map. This uh, the significant disruption of habitation on Guam, the, the Spanish decided they wanted to concentrate the Chamorros that survived the colonization and the brutal wars, all in five villages on Guam. Hinapsan, Haganya, Haga, Humanic, Inarahan. That is for all the, where the people were settled from all 15 islands. Although I think there's apple indication that Several people uh, still survive principally on Luta, immediately north of us. And again, you see on the left is the map that I showed before that we just had the northern portion. Now this map shows the entire island of Guam. Obviously the uh, mapping techniques are considerably different from today. And then you see another on the right, a Spanish map from the 1700s that has points identified. I apparently do not see Magua on this map because when people no longer lived in a location, use of that name began to disappear, but not entirely. So let's, uh, let's move on. Going to be looking at a couple maps here. And these are United States maps, which is rather interesting because the U.S. military and Department of Interior made, I think, a reasonably good effort to continue to research, actually research and document place names. I would rather be interested if documents survive in the National Archives so that we can identify where this information was from. Uh, at the top, I put the various spellings we have seen over the years for Magua. I also want to uh, have a note at the bottom of this 1944 map, which is a map used in the uh, uh, Marine Corps and Army invasion in July of 44. But for the purposes of this presentation and, and other works I've done, I consider Savannah Fadang a part of Magua. Now I know principally the Navy has attempted to subserve that and call the area Savannah Fadang. Magua is goes back to a habitation site 
literally Sabana Fadang means a grassland with Federico growing in it. So I'll, I'll go to when we look at later at the census show that the only place name used in this census was, was Magua. And you'll notice uh, places that we're familiar with there at the time. Uh, Tiguac, Haputo. Now something, uh, another aspect that's coming up, we've cropped off at the top, but Magua was, con was part of the municipality of Machinau until after the war. And that will show up in the census. So not did he do, Machinau. Continue on. 11 years later, the area has become part of Naval Communication Station. You can see the current Route 3. And up in the upper right-hand corner is current Potts Junction. And you can see uh, some military buildings, the principal road where it says Togwak. That's where the gate is today for uh, Naval Computer and Telecommunication Station. Magua is noted here, although I will take a sub exception that uh, Aputo is a misidentified. It's actually the embayment on the coastline there. But I'm, I'm showing a continuity of place names, even uh, fortunately recorded on uh, US maps. So let's continue. These are, nine, these are 2018 photos when I was fortunate to go to this location before it was destroyed to showing clear evidence of early Chamorro habitation in the area, the Haligi and the Lusong. Navy tried to say this was only intermittent habitation. A fair amount of uh, my associates and myself feel that people would not spend an enormous amount of time constructing Laddie and using a, a Lusong if they're only intermittently there. Now let's continue on. Uh, prior to the destruction, there was a shallow dis, uh, depression, kind of saucer shaped up in this portion of Magua. And this is very close to where the Laddie were, where the um, PO, the bamboo grove is located at. And I was fortunate to go into the middle of that and the ground slopes perhaps another five to 10 feet. To me, it's a natural sump, a natural location where water would accumulate, which would be a place to collect water for people who live there. I'm also making a reference to Rosalind Hunter Anderson's professional paper, Cultural Responses to a Late Climatic Oscillation in the Mariana Islands, Micronesia, lessons from the past. Roslyn postulates in this paper that about 500 years ago, there was considerably more water rainfall on the Guam. And of course that would mean habitation, particularly where you don't have freshwater streams was very feasible. Uh, just, just to demonstrate uh, an aspect that discounts the fact that it was only intermittently occupied. And the other thing, um, another logical aspect is many places in the Northern Guam Plateau that has not been urbanized or cleared for agriculture, you find vast numbers of uh, pottery sherds, pieces of broken pottery. I am suspecting that this pottery was just sent out by the people to collect the rainwater. I don't know of any other explanations for vast amounts of pottery in the area. Now I wanna to jump to more recent occupation of the area. What has been found and at least partially made available by the Navy is uh, pre-war cisterns used to collect water and then also some artifacts. These, uh, this is a remnant of a teapot from Japanese uh, origin imported to Guam. I tend to think this was associated with the people who just, who just lived on the land show in the area because this was a rural area of, of the ranches of Northern Guam. Uh, the Navy, and I'm going to be critical of the Navy, but I think rightfully so, they attributed these pieces of artifacts as, as 
uh, Japanese lacquerware to the military being in the area in 1940, the Jap 1944, the Japanese military. However, there's no artifacts of military uh, equipment associated with this. And I think if you look at our history, it will show that our amount of considerable amount of trade with the Japanese before the war. Uh, certainly, certainly uh, records of copra going to Japan and certainly these trade goods would come back. Well, let's head on. And uh, what we're mentioning of, of Lancho's a more traditional lifestyle of people living off the land, raising crops, having animals, Lancho's ranches. And while I certainly do not know the location or the time frame of this, I think it's a relatively representative uh, photo of what you would find at a Lancho. If anybody happens to know the uh, identity of this location, time frame, and the and the lady that's posing for the picture, I also feel it, it's a uh, rather interesting that the bicycle and now I'm beginning to wonder if this may be also immediate pre-war because I see 55 gallon oil drums that I don't know if they were here before the war so this is just being representative not necessarily conclusively for Magua. Well let's move on. Quite an interesting Navy aerial reconnaissance photograph of Guam. There's an immense series of these in the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, taken to record what was going on before the invasion. This is partial of Magua, partial of, of Nick Cam's. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you see the coastline at Double Reef Beach. The extreme upper left-hand corner is Double Reef. This does not do justice to the quality of the photo. All those light patches are the lanchos of this area. And during the wartime, people left the Ganya because they wanted to avoid the Japanese and lived off, off the land. And these photos give vivid proof of human use, tomorrow's living off the land in at least April, 1944. When you get these photos out and put a magnifying glass to it, you can literally see the little um, shelters there and actually the individual trees growing in, in rows. So quite an interesting revealing. Again, this is just perhaps the Western or Northwestern portion of this coastline, but uh, an immensely important document dealing with uh, our history. And let's continue. Now, I want to mention what had happened to the area since the military uh, had taken the area over right after the uh, liberation to use vast amounts of land for bases. This area became Naval Communications Station. And while the initial station was further to the south, about where the abandoned Navy housing is, this was up further north and the top is the 1950. There is a label of a site uh, about midway on the right side. It's a direction finding antenna and shack. Uh, if you just look at the top of that direction finding antenna term, that's where the bamboo grove and the laddie were located at. And of course, going further six years, 10 years later, look at the base in the 1960s, a considerable more of construction had taken place. The, uh, what, what we've called the elephant cage is built at the end of that road that is no longer in existence. That was actually a structure used to monitor Soviet submarine communications. But you'll notice the road went through what we know is a portion of Maga. And in essence, very little destruction was done because the forest was retained on both sides of the road. So that brings us up to the 60s. And in essence, it stayed like this 
through the 70s and the 80s, with most of the base being down in the operations building and the housing of, in the middle of the photo. Well, let's, uh, let's continue. It became very evident of massive destruction of Magua in the clearance for the Marine Corps base. Yeah, this actually occurred beginning in October of 2018. A ground view and then a photo that you can easily see of the clearing from, from an airplane flight. It was unfortunate and I think it was clearly disrespectful and showing arrogance that this entire area had to be cleared for the base. I think something should have been done in the in the uh, viewpoints of say sustainability and green, they could have worked the base facilities in with the cultural resources and the forest and maintained much more of that green cover, but the Marine Corps just wanted to put their stamp on the island. In other words, the, the planning was faulted. I'm also certain that the cultural resource surveys were inadequate due to the immense amount of uh, news coverage we've seen the last few years of, of what is purported to be discoveries. So let's take a look at, uh, <clears throat> now, if you look at the map, the aerial photo with an overlay, the orange is all the area that has gone through the legal hoops of the environmental impact statement and the, uh, cultural resources, historic preservation, that's what can be cleared. The circle in the middle is where the bamboo and the laddie were at. And admittedly artifacts were salvaged, but salvaging artifacts such as the blue song and the laddie, are, that's just taking out selected artifacts and not part of historic preservation. When an area was bulldozed, no more historic preservation. Continue. Here is a rough indication based upon the current US Geological Survey map of what now is known in the black oval of where was Magua Cultural Resources. And again, it's, it's in the area that we've identified previously. I know we could spend a lot more time looking at all these maps and identifying certain features uh, to the right of the Oval is Potts Junction. The road up to uh, Retidian Point goes off the top of the map. We have uh, the route from Diddy Doo up to Potts Junction, kind of the red line, which is also a military boundary line there. Down at the bottom is the current entrance to Nick Camp. So Magua Village uh, or Magua itself was quite an extensive area. I don't think if we'll ever know how tight a village it was in uh, pre-contact times. Now, how did all this happen? Continue on to the next slide. There was the infamous military program, programmatic agreement of the military buildup of 2011, principally between the Navy and the Guam Historic Preservation Office. In this document, there is a simple one statement projects J1, JP100, P101, J17 will have adverse effects on historic properties. Signing off on that was where our Guam Shippo signed off on the destruction. Now, admittedly, it will provide data recovery in the next sentence, subject to annual review, this is the annual meeting, prior to taking action that could affect these properties. Nevertheless, unfortunately, this is a scan, that's why the, the uh, font is different from the document. On pages 12 and 13, the legal justification for the destruction. In essence, the military had no interest in preservation of Magua and Guam Shippo signing off, Shippo's State Historic Preservation Officer signed off on a destruction of Magua. It's unfortunate that we had and we still have an attitude that we are not assertive going beyond the fence to protect our cultural resources in these areas. And I do think 
we need to have strong advocacy under the National Historic Preservation Act. I'm waiting for that to be seen. Well, let's continue on. Now you may say, well, we got the Guam Repository, which I believe is now close to uh, completion for all these artifacts to be placed, but that's not historic preservation. It actually sends the wrong message that we're satisfied with destroying these uh, Chamorro village sites as long as the artifacts are given to us. Ironically, curation of artifacts is a federal responsibility, a budgetary responsibility, but when it goes to the Guam repository, that becomes a burden on the financial resources of the government of Guam. Well, let's take a look at the next uh, photo. I wanted to mention briefly a booklet that may uh, that came out maybe a couple of years ago now, possibly under the resources of the US Navy, but there's no copyright information, there's no publisher, there's no author given. And it alludes to uh, some artifacts. I have taken a couple of photos from this uh, booklet and put in this uh, uh, presentation of what is uh, seen up there. There's no mention of Magua Village at all in the booklet. And uh, it mentions archeology span in North Finnegan, Guam. Uh, this was Magua, not Finnegan, North Finnegan. Finnegan, if you look at your map, is actually at the western, I'm sorry, the eastern end of uh, Harmon Field. So a considerable dislocation of misuse of uh, Chamorro place names. Now let's go on to uh, the next slide, which, which is something I've gotten into rather recently and really brings home to many families on the island connections, interest in the heritage of lands that the families used, owned, uh, ranched on, and many members uh, could very well be alive. This is the 1940 census of Guam. And this is the overall mapping of the area. You'll notice there are two village, two municipalities that no longer exist as constituted in 1940. Sume on Arodi Peninsula, and then what we've mentioned before, Machinau. Machinau has been absorbed into Didi Do and Jigo principally because 90% of it is military bases. Taking a look at the next page, a very brief glimpse of how the populations in the census were categorized. And by municipalities, they also, within the municipalities, designated the subunits as barrios. I originally thought we just used barrios for Hagania, but apparently it learned something that puts this forward. And look at the bottom of the middle column. You'll see the... Uh, Barrios of Machinau, and there's a wealth of them. In the middle of that list is Maga. You've also got others there of uh, oh, what comes to mind. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find. There's Retidian. Uh, but when we're going to deal with uh, Magua, there's, there's 26 people that we recorded as living there. Now, unfortunately, I could not find municipality maps to actually show where that was defined. Well, let's continue on to the two sheets of Magua Barrio. I apologize for the quality of this, but this is uh, what you can actually get this online, the 1940 Census of Guam particularly look for it initially by a municipality and then you'll find the bios and nice hand script of the recorder. You can see some of those, I've blown up the list of the people there and you can quickly identify uh, some of the last names, uh, Manabusan, Blas, uh, 
Kittachai, Titan Fong, and continue on to the next page, which is number 26. The next, there we go. Uh, now maybe perhaps uh, uh, Michael or somebody else can make better uh, reading of that than I can, but that's clearly 26 people that identified and were recorded on the census, along with their relationships to the family, their age, what their occupations were, their place of birth. That was 1940 census. And now let's jump to the next one, next document. Another glimpse of our island's history, 1950. This is from the District Court of Guam, the records of the land takings for case 10-50. You can go, I would encourage you to go to the clerk's office at the district court. They will make the uh, original documents for the land takings available to you. It has court proceedings. It has maps. This is just one portion of a much larger uh, size map dealing with the land takings. So the wealth of information of the lots. The uh, Magua is approximately in the center and towards the upper right hand corner you can make out where Potts Junction is identifiable because that was a, a boundary for this land taking. Not only is this case at the court, but all the rest of the 1950 land takings of Guam are there. Now let's go to the next photo. I just am using this initial listing in the initial court filings for this case to identify the owners, heirs or claimants of the various properties of Magua. I, I did not get into subsequent documents. That becomes a, a whole major project in itself with the people who need title research to go through perhaps an inch or more of papers to find out what subsequently was decided. Uh, perhaps other people became claimants. And then let's go to the next uh, slide. I did a quick cross reference between the, the civil case, which is in the middle, and the census is on the right. And I did come across, I did locate Ramon Ada and Vincente Titanfong on both, a landowner and in the census. Now, why others were not identified, I'm certain there's easy rationale is because if your whole family lived on a lot, you were the only one who was con considered the landowner. And it could very well be, uh, such as Jesus Cruz Artero at the bottom, their residency was in Hagania, not up in, uh, up in Magua. So some real logical reasons to have an understanding of why we don't have consistent matches up in this. Now let's continue on. I just want to mention the aspect of burials that have came up. Uh, the Navy has indicated 17 burials identified. The Navy's been quite uh, reclusive in going out to the people and identifying what is should be considered the cultural resources of the people of Guam, ironically. The Navy uses the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, which they have discretion to not use, to not reveal cultural resources. It's rather interesting that that only applies to archaeological sites, but that has now been basically obliterated. Uh, through the efforts of myself and uh, Michael Bavacqua, at least we know of two Chamorro burials who are probably from the wartime. And that information came from families who came forward. I really hope the Navy goes further in their research and doing DNA work. 
And I also recently came across, I was looking at the files of the Guam Combat Patrol at the Flores Library and came across a uh, recordation of one Japanese straggler killed in this area on May 22nd, 1946. So that is uh, information that is available and I'm hoping more information will come out. Continue. I do want to thank you for this opportunity. I know I've just given a rather quick and perhaps a bit hurried response on uh, some interesting information that's become a, a project of my own. I do want to encourage people to uh, make contact with myself on Facebook or my email address right there. I am working on a paper that I would like to finish soon on Mongo. I'd actually hope to have it finished, but more information keeps coming up all the time. And I would like to see if there's anybody who is able to do some GIS, geographical information system work to put these maps together. I'm looking for somebody who might be willing to do some volunteering effort because these maps you've seen would be of immense value if we could do some overlays on this. So please don't hesitate to contact me and I hope, I hope you'll have further information to share on this as we explore a component of our island's history. Thank you so much. Sidzus Masi, so much, uh, Dave, for your presentation. And to those of you watching, put for board, if you have any comments or any questions, please, uh, you can send them on social media. Uh, you can send them, uh, you can put them into the comments. Uh, we will have a time for, uh, for some discussion, for some Q&A. But before we get to that, though, um, I'm very, very thankful that we have joining with us representatives from two of the families that were mentioned uh, by Dave in his presentation from the Magua area. We have uh, with us Vince Didasco, um, who is a representative of, who is representing his mother, who lived in, who, who lived in that area. And, and then we also have Vince Taitingfong, whose, whose family also comes from the Magua area. And so each of them, I've asked each of them, and I'm uh, Hugo Fagredesi, I'm thankful that they have decided to share some of their family's experiences and stories. And as Dave mentioned, these are also families which um, have dead, that have burials in that area too. And so one of the important things, uh, one of the important reasons why we should unearth this history, we should talk about it, we should tell these stories is because so that we can make these connections. Um, that this is not just empty land. This is not just sort of land that is great for military bases. This is land that Chamorros farmed, Chamorros lived on, and they died on. And so I'm thankful. And so, um, uh, Senor Vince uh, Didasco, if you don't mind, uh, yes, I'll allow you to share. And so please go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and then tell us your family's connection to the Magua area. Senor, are you there? Oh, wait, you may still be on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Hungan, Hungan, Anikiha. Okay. Um, so uh, my, my knowledge of the history of this area began with the uh, oral testimony from my mom when I sat her down to apply for the World War II reparations that happened a few years back and has again been recently in the news uh, because she was turned down for submitting her information late. We never knew about the program till later on. Then uh, my cousin Rudy, who's on here also, Rudy Manabusen, uh, sent me the article that's uh, asked, I think it was from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mike, uh, asking for uh, descendants to come forward in the news article. And uh, then he, we met with him just recently here in early February, where we learned more about the program. Uh, so to take off from where Mr. Lotz left off, uh, I represent uh, Jose Guerrero Manabusen, 
who is my mother's father. And uh, during her oral testimony uh, back in 2018, when we were going through all of this, um, later on, she mentioned the families of Titan Club. And I see Vince is on here, so he may be he may know the uncles that I was familiar with as I grew up with the Titan Fung family. And then you'll hear today some of the oral testimony from the hours of recordings that I had, where my mother mentions uh, Uncle Manette Manabusen, which is Lorenza Manabusen, uh, here in the map. We had no knowledge of this map, no knowledge of our neighbors, uh, and I pulled this just from her oral testimony, and then learning about this map later on. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to contribute uh, to the programs to try to uh, uh, get the uh, lands here properly identified and the cultural history back for these families. Uh, any questions on that chart? Okay, oh, no. so go ahead. go ahead again. Okay, so same thing here. Uh, uh, land number 1011, Jose Guerrero Manabusen is my great grand, my grandfather, my grandfather and the father of my, uh, uh, my mother. So we know who we're talking about. This is my mother today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, two days ago. She suffered a stroke on February 15th, I believe. And uh, so she is cognizant. She can hardly speak, but I wish you could see and hear some of the dialogue that we have here because it was hard for her to recall and remember during the oral research, a lot of the stuff she had put away. And my cousins, Rudy and, and Joey, and uh, also experienced that through our parents that they were reserved in telling us a lot about what happened during the war, or we probably just didn't ask the right questions until later on. Uh, but my, you'll see in the oral testimony that my mother was very uh, uh, knowledgeable and recalled. She was nine years old when the Japanese attacked Guam and living in a gang. Uh, can you see this picture here? Yes, yes. Okay, so these are her brothers and sisters. Uh, Uncle Nick here was in the Navy when the uh, Japanese attacked Guam. He was in the US Navy. Uncle Ton was probably 16. Uncle John here who joined the Navy after the war was 11. And uh, Uncle Joe was probably 14. And my mother was nine. Uh, during the war. We're part of the Laguatnia Gundy family, and the, uh, that's going through my mother's side, uh, Laguatnia. Now, we're talking about the Manabusan side, which we knew little about until just recently. Uh, we're trying to put the pieces together for my grandfather, uh, Guerrero Manabusan. So this is uh, my mother's side of the family, and this is my mother back, I think this was 2009 or 2010, uh, family reunion. Uh, this is a photo that I uh, that we recovered during the uh, family reunion. Um, these are my grandmother's uh, sisters and my um, uh, yeah Juana Padilla. Probably this one right here is my nana, my mother's mother. This is my mother in the picture. Uh, similar style homes that uh, Mr. Lott showed us in the photo, uh, and the, the photos that we saw had a lot of bikes and a lot of 55 gallon drums. Uh, throughout the uh, well, when we grew up. Uh, let's see, I'd like to go on over to, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna try this, but I'm gonna try the oral testimony now when my mother talks about uh, back in 2018, uh, living in uh, Matanao, and I have a hard time saying that. Let's see if I can pull those up here. And so, oh, so you know, just make sure that uh, if you're sharing the file that you make it so that you share the audio. Share audio, okay. So, Hungan, are you gonna just play it or are you gonna share it as a file or are you just gonna play it in front of you or? Yeah, I'm gonna play it and see if it, if it comes out correct. If you guys okay. can hear it. Can you hear that? No, no, we can't. Um, so what you'll need to do is go ahead and end your share. And then, and then when you reshare it, 
uh, just make sure that you click share audio as well. And then you, it should be able to go through. What, where were you, where were you at when the Japanese took you? Oh, oh there we go. Here we go. The Japanese from our land, and Tiku. I mean, yeah. Matsunano, not Tiku, but Matsunano. something Matsunano. here wrong. There you go. But that in Manila, us in that concentration camp, that in Maningo. Okay. They took us where, from where every from ranch. We, well, we left that, our ranch to go to that concentration camp. How did you get to the concentration We walk. I know. Well, we didn't walk because my brother got the blue card. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Forced you to walk from what? Where were you? Where were you at when the Japanese took you? When the Japanese from our land, in Tiku. I mean, Matsanano, not Tiku, but Matsanano. Matsanano. Yeah. This is the first I ever heard of Matsanano. During this it's, month, it's, it's almost to Jigo. Uh, it's not, it's about how many uh, months? Um, where it's I told uh, you that. Uh, <coughs> it's not that far, it's only about 10 miles away from my, from my, uh, my ranch to Anderson. So Montanano was near Anderson? Yeah. I show it to you with the. My ranch is our ranch. Okay, so that's one. If you bear with me, I got just about four more minutes. Is that okay? Before the American came in, I was I hiding. In, my brother hid me in a little cave. Little, it's not that big cave. It's a little cave where they cannot see and they put all kind of leaves in there. You know, so in in, uh, Matanano, you know, Matanano. Anderson, yeah, close to Anderson. Because we went to Maningon when the concentration started. Yeah. yeah. So in 19th January. So that's uh, her telling us that she was hiding in Matanano during the Japanese occupation. Uh, my mother did not go to Japanese schools. Her brothers hit her in the jungle for the year and a half before they were moved to the concentration camp, uh, she hid daily in the jungles up there in that area. It was a little, it was a little, little cemetery. But I don't know whether I did find, ever find my father's. But what's this? You're, I'm recording it. So yeah. your, um, so your mom, your dad, during the occupation. You guys moved from Aganya to to the ranch to the ranch to Machinano, yeah. And then at Machinano, your dad would live for about uh, a year. But, uh, no, not even a year because yeah. he he would he died before the concentration. He died before, but uh, before the American came in, but during the Japanese occupation occupation, he yeah. was still alive. And then you buried him but at the ranch. He was buried at the ranch. And then yeah. the ranch where he was buried. Was it? It's not on your property. It was somewhere where there it's was a, a cemetery. It's a little cemetery, yeah. yeah. But I don't know where. I can say on that side, on that side, because, you know, I don't know. They don't have any sign or anything. You don't have name. a stone or anything like that? And what's your, what's your dad's name? Uh, Manibu, Guerrero Manibusan. What's your full name? Her former, former name, Jose Guerrero Manibusan. Jose Guerrero Manibusan. Manibusan. That's yeah. your dad. Yeah, that, my dad. And what's your mother's name? My mother is Laguana Manipusa. And then who else lived around the ranch with you? My brothers. Oh, no, who my, like my you? Aunt, my Uncle Joe Laguana. Uncle Joe the Laguana. Family. They, had a, they had land at the ranch? No. my Our property. But we built, my brother built them a ranch. Okay, but who was, like who a, was in the ranch next to you? Okay. Narita. All the three sisters, you know, my, my mother's sisters. Who's Nanrita? And Nanrita is to say, you know, look at Nanzo, look at Nan, father. And, uh, you know, Ben Riarty, they're all gone already. Ben Riarty? The Riarty, yeah. And they had ranches near your ranch? No, they all built in our, my brother built all their, you know, their hoods. Oh, at the ranch? Yeah, at but our. What other but, families own ranches around you? Oh, I don't know, the. They're far away from Yeah, far other. away, but who would yeah. that be? Do you remember any names around you? I know that, but I don't know their last name. I forgot their last name. 
Oh, would you remember what their auntie or their I, I know then Antonian Onchu then Onchu. Onchu had a ranch Onchu near Oyo ranch. ranch. Yeah, the Onchu the and the I forgot where who they are the ranch. Because we got a big property. We hardly and the um the Cardenas, but far again Cardenas. Yeah. You know, uh, Tai like Tai Ting Kung, Tai Ting Kung or Tai something like that. I don't know what's their last name, but we call them Cardinals. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's a Tai Ting Kung family. But the Tai Ting Kung, we don't, we never did meet the Tai Ting Kung until we were after the war. Mm -hmm. You know, Ben, you know, Ben. You know, the Tai Ting Kung that we know, the Cardinals. But they're up you in know. the ranch area. But they live in that area. They are. Oh my God, I can't figure it because far away, because our property is so big that we don't, we don't hear the, yeah. even my uncle, Tatane. Who's Tatane? What's his Tatane name? Tatane is Manet Guerrero Manibusan. Mm. Yeah. That's the but other Manibusan. he's far away, he's about 10 miles away from my house, mm. from my ranch. At, at Matanana. our ranch, yeah. Huh? But Matanana. they're still in Matsanano. Oh, still in Matsanano. Yeah, but he's close to the highway, you know, the road to Anderson. Mm -hmm. He's close over there. For us, we're down to the Uruno site. If you don't mind, I'll stop here. If you recall, she's nine years old, so big and far away, away is relative, right? And going to the jungle. Uh, the other part she remembers that really stuck out was Uncle Manette Manabusen's property was by the road. And I think uh, Dr. Mike shared with us that that was Route 3 on that map uh, that borders uh, uh, Lorenzo Manabusan's property. And that's who we're talking about. So from her recall, without ever looking at any map, uh, was right along with what we see now. What other families live? And this is almost done. Lived around you at the ranch. You know anybody, any other families around Well, you? I know uh, on two, but I don't know their last name. I don't know. And uh, the Manibusan family is across the street. What Manibusan family? Um, I don't know what the Manibusan, probably Audi will remember the, the Manibusan family on your side. But, and then we're far, because our ranch is far away from the road, you know. But this Manibusan is close to the, Road to Anderson, mm. yeah. But I don't know. And you in uh, at the what do you call that Mat Matanano? Matanano. Matanano. And yeah. you were uh, and when you were up there as a young girl, you were hiding in the jungle. Not in the jungle, in the Bokungo, in the uh, cave. In the cave. Yeah. For how long you, did you hide in the cave? I do. You know they don't hide me all the time. Only when they know that the Japanese are go, you know, going around hunting for girls. Mm. I mean, you know, searching for girls. And then they hide, they put you in. So the they put me in the uh, cave. How about do you remember Ramon Titan Fong? Yeah, she Cardenas. That's the Cardenas family. Uh huh. Ramon. They call it, you know, family name Cardenas. You know, going to my uncle's, you know, from my ranch to going to my to the mm -hmm. That's the ranch on the right side. So you'll see on that map, um, there's a Taitikung family, right is relative wherever she's coming from, but right near her property. Uh, that was interesting also to find out. And I don't know if that's the family that's related there to the Vince on the, on the line here, um, but that, that'd be interesting to find out. And it, I think this is the last one, but this one only uh, is just a, a short one that shows- In the morning. Manangan area. Maningo, no, that's in, that's during the, uh, Mabcha area. Uh, the, Machano. we were, Machanano, Machanano. Well, that's in, I don't know what they call that. Uh, they call it Machanano. And they called it, uh, walk, I mean, uh, but, uh, they call it communication uh, center, NCS, now. NCS now, yeah, right, and NCS, De yeah. No, Machanano. On the other side of Dedindu. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, I shared that last one to, to show that in today's world, uh, she knew relatively where her property was with NCS. 
And, and like I said, up until 2018, I never heard of that area or that name until she started to recall and we forced her to tell us where she lived. Uh, we used to mm -hmm. just call it the ranch out in that area. Uh, so that's, uh, that's our site. So thank you for taking the time and listening. And I hope that helps a little bit. And I'll try to get this better organized for you and Dave, however you want to do it. Uh, I'll try to pull it out for you and, and uh, help with that part of the research. Jesus, Marcy, Senor, thank you so much. And, and I'm glad that your, your mom is, 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 is doing okay now and that she's recovering. Um, every one of our war survivors that's still around is, is such a precious gift. And so I'm, I'm glad, especially that your family has been talking to her and, and, and sharing stories. And so I wanted to also bring in another family from the Magua area. And, and another Vince, interestingly enough, Dosna Vince Winnie, Dosna Vicente Winnie, Vince uh, Taitingfong. <laughs> and so, Senor Put Favor, uh, if you don't mind, please tell us about your uh, family's uh, connection into the Magua area. So, Buenas and done half a day. So, um, the reason why there's two Vince, because there is a connection with uh, Vince Velasco, because uh, um, he may not realize it, uh, but that's my god brother there. So, um, just listening to the audio there that um, his mom mentioned, uh, Ben Taitingfong, that's my dad. So, um, so this finally get to see him after so many years and stuff. So, but there is a connection here. So, yes, there is a tie with the <coughs> the Mogwak area. Uh, when I saw one of the articles that Senor Dave Locks um, wrote in the PDN, it says when I saw the the name Titan Fung there, and I says, oh, I better see if I can contact him to see if I can get some more information. So um, we kind of connected a little bit and trying to exchange information. So I really appreciate his work on this and just keep up the work on that. So um, I, I know for me to provide a testimony here is that uh, what can we do? I mean, what can I provide information in regards to, um, hold on a second that I, I know that with, in regards to the common theme that we mostly hear about military fam, I mean, um, indigenous people having land on, on military land and that they were, you know, they want their land back. But for this particular area, you know, it's, you know, it's very special to me in regards to um, my connection to that area. So just like with my god brother Vince here in regards to his um, reasons for his interests here. So I'm just going to read a little bit in regards to um, like my God's brother Vince mentioned in regards to the war claim. Uh, I'll just read a little excerpt in regards to what my father um, provided for his war claim. But <clears throat> well, you know that during uh, you know the early 1940s and stuff, you know, a lot of the Chamorros lived in, in Agania. So they had their, their ranches and the launches located on the north. Um, just like my grandfather, Jesus Borja Taitingfong, um, his primary residence was in Aganya, but then during the during the war, they were moved up to to the ranch areas up in Magua. Now, I know Dr. McGee, we, we discussed about this because there's a big distinction in regards to the area called Magua and the area called Senegwadza. So when my family refers to that area, they talk about uh, so I didn't hear too much about uh, the Magwet name, but it's also just the Finnegwadzak um, area of, of that portion of the island. So um, so the time frame that I'm going to refer to in, in my dad's testimony here is that um, around June, and this is most likely um, where, you know, the, uh, this is probably close to the rainy season, um, where most likely the farmers would be impacted where, you know, during that time. Um, so just reading off here from my father's testimony here is that in regards to when I was about four years old, around June, July, 1944, our family consisted of my mother, Constellation Oria, Ariola Taitingfong, my sister Teresita, um, age five, Anna, age three, Cecilia, almost about two, 
And then my father, Jesus, bought a Titan phone that also with, um, with my grandmother, she was pregnant at the time during her last term of during, around this time. So with my father here, his Zeus Bora Titan phone was forced to stay on our ranch in the area that was once called Finnegan, which is now called Finnegan, uh, near Nick Tams Dedido. According to stories that my mom rarely talked about and hearing bits and pieces of stories from relatives through the years, my father was forced to grow food for the Imperial soldiers on our ranch. The Imperial soldiers would come to the ranch almost daily taking food for what we had. We had to hide some of our food, food rations for ourselves to survive because the soldiers would take almost everything that they can take. During the last week of June 1944, my father got sick from harvesting and was forced labor because the Imperial soldiers wanted more food. And the Americans became, you know, more, more presence in the area. My father was sick in bed and missed a daily roll call for delivery of foods for the soldiers. And what they did is that they grabbed my father out of bed, threw him in the back of the truck for him to go out to the farm to go get the food for the soldiers. Since he was sick, the soldiers started beating him badly because he missed roll call. And he wanted to make an example of all the, of, of the farmers in the area. Get to the last part here. <clears throat> Spend that. So when the soldiers did not get the food for the day, according to the mom, according to my mom, the imperial soldiers beaten up so badly, he was very unresponsive, and they threw his body off from the truck. My mother, who was seven and a half months pregnant, stated that my elder sister and Teresita and I, this is around five years old and four year old, assisted my mother in getting my father into the house. I wasn't sure that he was barely alive, but he passed immediately after we got him to the house. So during that time, <clears throat> of that time frame and stuff, um, you know, there was no Pigo Cemetery, there's no other cemetery. So during that time with the Japanese presence and stuff, you know, they had to bury my grandfather there. So just imagine where your my grandmother being seven and a half months pregnant with four other little kids during that time through the Japanese occup uh, occupation. And, and some discussion I had with you, uh, Dr. McGett, that you know, this is around the Time frame where in the area where the soldiers was basically, you know, forcing the people around that area for food, and also then, and I've been hearing different types of stories that they were also looking for some U.S. servicemen that was hiding in the area, so they were forcing, you know, the, the Chamoas in that area. You know, justifying you know the servicemen and also forcing you know, uh, forcing food from them. So, but now at this time, you know, with you know what after um, my grandmother gave birth, you know, she did the Menengan walk. From what I heard too, from the testimony there, that yes, from I heard that that bull cart trail that they had, I heard about that in regards to when the family had to pack up to do the Menengan walk as well from that bull cart. Uh, trail there. Um, from from the stories that I heard from my relatives and stuff, where um, they ne my grandmother never had a chance to go back to the area, and then all of a sudden they seal up that area where we couldn't get access to um, to the to that property. For many years and stuff, you know, every time I drive by that area, they always say, "Oh, your grandfather's buried in that area in that jungle," but we can't get access to. But now that the military has somewhat disturbed that area, which probably allow us more access to, to that area. And this is where my plea is, is now that you disturb that area, give us that access to, to that property to exhume my grandfather and give him a proper uh, Christian burial. So 
to do smart. So basically, stuff. that's you know, my statements and stuff. Where I like to see you know more than just a family member, you know, trying to get their property back from the military. My main focus of this forum here is that you know, hey, this is a little bit more than just ancient burial sites. Uh, with my god brother there, that said that he has uh, a family member buried there. So this is just a little bit more than just the name that we have here. So we got a name of people buried there and probably want to share just just a picture of him. It's a rare picture that I have of my grandfather. So I just want to see if I could present that. So if I could allow yes, to share. Yes, please do. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so how do I share this here from? Uh, go ahead and click on the share screen button at the bottom of the Zoom box. Or, and you should be able to, to share. There we go. So let me know if you can see that. Yes, again. So this is a picture of my grandfather when he just got married him back in 1938. So this is the person here that um, that you know my family members are saying that this is buried up in in Infinite slash Magua area. And so uh, it's just a post this picture up here. So this is my main focus of this area. Sidus Masi. Thank you, uh, both Vinces. Thank you so much for uh, doing your part to humanize this area, to sort of connect your stories, your family stories, and then Sidus Masi Vince for sharing that picture. At the end, it's, it's nice to see that picture. And then to the other Vince, it's nice to hear your mother's voice, uh, sort of just providing more depth and texture uh, to this. And so, I wanted uh, now we're we're in the section now for for questions. Michael, uh, Michael, go ahead. I can, uh, extend my personal thanks for both of the Vinces to share their family background. Thank you very much. I know there's also Rudy, cousin Rudy here as well. And so, uh, uh, did you want to to share a little bit too about sort of uh, from your perspective as well? Yeah. Okay. So. Back in the 60s and 70s, we used to farm across that area. And when we we're growing up, people say, oh, that's a military land. Well, that was my that was my like my playground. Me and my cousin would go hunting in there. And when my uncle John, my young, my dad's younger brother, re retired from the Navy, he would also take us across to the NCS or now. And 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 like like Vince Taitifong mentioned, my father also called that Fedaguazo. He, I never heard the, the name Machanao. He always says, yeah, we, we were raised in Finaguazu. We had a ranch in Finaguazu. So anyways, so my uncle John would, would go to hunting in there. We go hunting there a lot. And he would take me to the area where he says, I, this is where my grand, this is my, prop, my family's property, Tata's property, and this is where Tata is buried. And he goes, there's a lemon tree and a lemmy tree around the burial area. That was the the the... The, um, the the mark the sto the marking areas where he remembered um, the the burial site, and like I mentioned, to Vince, you know, with with Ati Chai being the the last living descendant of of our Tata, if if like Vince says, if we can like the, Mr. Tatefong mentioned, if we can get some kind of DNA uh, with Ati Chai's DNA, we can probably match match it up using that and and and. Um, and provide proper burial for for our tot for our grandfathers or taught us. Yeah, but yeah, that was our <laughs> so-called playground when I was growing up back in the sixties and seventies. We go hunting in there. But uh, I just went by there last last weekend, last Sunday, and I stopped by the beside the road and I looked inside and said, "Man, that is a large three four story building." I'm saying I think that's where. That's where my my daughter's property is at. That and moving in, and it's just, um, it's just really it, there's nothing we can do. I mean, everything just is just cleared out, and buildings are just building and growing up everywhere. But um, yeah, that, that's yeah. all I've got to to, to to share today. 
Jesus Masi, Senor, thank you so much for, for sharing as well. And so, uh, Dave, we have some questions. And then if you have questions for the Manabusan or the Tai uh, Fung families as well, please comment with them or send them to me. But Dave, I do have one question here. And the question is, why wasn't, as part of the military's assessment, why didn't this history come out? Why is it that prior to this construction, the, this, this history, because uh, the area was being surveyed and assessed for years prior to 2018 when the area was bulldozed. So why, why, why didn't this come out sooner? I think very clearly there was inadequate cultural resource surveys done of the area. And I think uh, that's again where our, our SHPO office needed to be more, more assertive, more diligent and uh, doing our own independent research. And there should have been a real reach out to the people we're reaching out to right now. Uh, but you see, you deal with a different mindset with the military. I remember General Bice coming out. I remember General Bice, head of the buildup for a while? He was Again. a retired Marine Corps. He had a mission. His sole goal was the uh, build the base. You, you also have a sense that uh, we have laws on the books, Historic Preservation and National Environmental Policy Act. The military's goal is to make certain they have met, fulfilled those uh, laws, and basically they document that. Now that is a completely different goal than actual preservation. So we have to understand, even though you're operating under a purported Historic Preservation Act, that is a procedural act. You follow the procedures, you document it, and then you basically can do what you want, unfortunately. It's different from a substantive act. A substantive act is where you, you shall not do something. Your best example is Endangered Species Act. You kill an Endangered Species Act, you go to jail. So we have too many uh, procedural acts. Uh, and again, I cannot underemphasize the fact that under National Historic Preservation Act, we frankly have to learn collectively as a people to assert ourselves. This is one of the few federal acts that we actually can assert ourselves. Thank you so much. I have another question here, and that is, do you know of any federal, local, or legal recourse that the Magua family, such as the Manabusan and the Taitingfung families here, that they have to get confirmation from the military or from SHPO about these burials. So do you know of how does the procedure take place to find out, um, as was said, if there could be DNA confirmation, if they could get access to these areas to find these burials? Do you know, have any idea about how that process works? I, th I think initially we should see that existing political channels uh, so perhaps our delegate in Washington and our governor, she, really, my sense is they should become advocates uh, for this. It, it's a relatively, to me, it's a relatively simple procedure to follow. And uh, I think that would be where, you, where it should be started. As far as legal resources, I don't really have a good answer on that at this point. But let, let's see if... Let's see if our elected heads of the government can become advocates for this. I would encourage the families to approach those appropriate offices at their convenience. And I did see that a few uh, a few staff members from different uh, different local offices of elected leaders were tuning in. And, and I so don't, uh, I don't mean to ex exempt uh, other elected leaders. I just happened to think of the governor and the delegate, but we also certainly have the speaker of the legislature who's very much interested in this. And uh, Senor Didasco, did you have uh, something to add? Uh, well, I had a question and it has to do with uh, uh, NCS as it stands today. During my visit, I drove by NCS and it looks abandoned from the, from the route that I was on, you know, that freeway there. Is it still operational? Uh, well, th thank you for that. I, as I said in the beginning, I was, I was there 
70 to 73. There was manpower intensive fleet communications and also what was called security group was basically spying on the, uh, the Soviets and the Chinese. Security group has left the area probably 20 some years ago. Uh, the functions of radio communications has a revolutionized from basically teletype usage to computers. That means a lot less manpower. So there's, they're still functioning there. I, I haven't been in building 112, which is the heart of that. So I don't know what it's like, but just keeping appraised of, and uh, fortunately uh, one, of my, one of my friends was a commanding officer there a few years ago. So he told me about, we had a discussion about how teletypes is now a historic relic and it's all, it's all computers. So basically manpower needs have dropped Im immensely. I guess my intent is that with the Marine base clearing that area, uh, why didn't they just use whatever unused or uh, excess land with NCS? That is something I've tried to, to raise. I, I just think, frankly, the Marines wanted to have a line between their base and the, uh, and the, the NCS. The, the enlisted housing at NCS has all been torn down. Yeah. Matter of fact, I lived in one of those houses with my wife in, in 73. That is open real estate. It, mm -hmm. uh, that just adds to my argument how they could have had much better land use planning. Okay. That was my and, question. Thank you. And, and, and now, now, just a, just, now that, that base is now called Camp Blast. It's no longer called Nick Tams. It is now called Camp Blast. You know, I actually think there's going to be two separate terms up there, depending on who you're talking to. Well, as you enter the main gate, there's a big, huge sign. Welcome to Camp Blas. Well, then I stand corrected and I, I appreciate uh, yeah. you updating me on that because I haven't been there, been there in a while. So I guess that means the Navy becomes a tenant of the Marines. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. And, and I agree with Vince. There's so, there's so much vac vacant land out there. And, and you know, those, those, what do we call golf balls are so spread apart, you can probably put in a couple of marine barracks in between. Yeah. One, one note for Adi, just uh, and, uh, since he mentioned lemma tree, and I haven't heard that, I do remember my mom, and I've got to go find it, when she was talking about burying grandpa, she did mention something about the lemma tree somewhere inside there. I haven't heard that term in a long time, but when you just said it, now I got to go back and look for it. But you know, you've mentioned something I don't see on cultural resource surveys. That is identifying the vegetation, the plants in the area. To me, that bamboo was a key indicator of something. When you see the, the trees you mentioned, to me, it's a clear indication that doesn't naturally occur there. Perhaps it's been planted there. And I've seen that up at near the munition storage area at Anderson. There's, a, there's an abandoned Taurus family concrete farmhouse there. And when you look at the landscape, you can tell the plants are telling a story. Vince, uh, Titan Fung, did you have something that you wanted to, to add in? I saw you unmute for... Oh uh, no! It just it's just amazing that you know what we're, we're trying to bring out the the hidden story of this of this area in regards to you know what what was happening there and and just in you know just from from the war and then referring to the plants because even with uh, my dad's sister um, mentioning that um, you know if she had access to the area she would know you know, where the possibility that, you know, my grandfather would be buried by certain plants in the area. So it's, you know, it's kind of strange that, you know, that, you know, this is being mentioned that, you know, the, if there was a, a mango tree or, or, or a chokanunu where, um, you know, in, in the area, just the type of plants in that area where, um, you know, we normally here as islanders make reference to, you know, the coconut trees or certain trees and stuff or, or the type of vegetation in the area. So 
yeah, it's just interesting to hear all this and stuff and, you know, gather it in one place and, and just to make sense because when I was talking to, to Dave, you know, he had bits and pieces of here and there. And, and then, you know, I had some pieces and then hearing from, from the Manabusan family too, just trying to push, put all these pieces here together and stuff and just to see, you know, what the true story is of what, you know, really happened and in, in, in what happened in that area. So, but, you know, moving forward, you know, I just hope that, you know, when they do this camp blast, that they don't do the same mistake what they did when it was Nick Tavs, when they labeled this North Finnegaisen and South Finnegaisen. So I hope that they uh, respect the area in regards to whatever street or what area or housing development that they, they name in that area, that they kind of honor of those people, of the families that, you know, originally own that area. So, you know, moving forward, I hope that they honor that. So that's something that we can push for. Very true, Hungan. And uh, Senor Dedasco, I have a I have a question or a comment for you from one of the viewers, and they say, since your mother is still alive and and hopefully she's still able to talk and share stories, does she have any memories of Lati or Lusong or other ancient artifacts near the family's farm or ranch? Because if she does, then that may be a way of helping to connect the dots in terms of the location of things because the, the military did identify some of, uh, some of those uh, artifacts um, in the area. And so if, you're, if, you're, you know, if your mom ever gets a, a chance to share more, then you may wanna ask her, was there any Lati stones near their ranch or on their ranch? Did they have Lusong in the area? Uh, and I copied the screen on that, on that picture uh, to, to ask those questions. So that's a good question. I'll ask her and we'll get back with you. Say, Michael. Go ahead, Dave, go ahead. The Chamorro place names has always interested me. And we've mentioned two that sound very similar, but are actually different. And I may not be the best in my pronunciation, but Finnegan, you look at the older maps, it's down at Harmon Field. Finnegan, and the other one, Finnegan, I'm, I'm not to say it. Fina, Fina, oh, so Finnegodzen Fina, and then Finnegodzuk. Yeah, the second one, I won't even try and pronounce it. But when you look at maps, it's in the general area of Potts Junction. And mm -hmm. I know one of our, our guests uh, was discussing that. And I think it's terribly important to, uh, to look at our, our place names because and I'm also thinking that in some cases, those boundaries were probably not terribly accurately defined, but families that lived in the area had a clear understanding. Mm -hmm. Very, very true, very true. And so, um, and so this is a, a simple question, Dave, for you. What can we do to make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen again? Echoing what uh, Vince Taitingfung, you know, Taitingfung was saying, that sort of the next time there's large scale construction, construction, whether it's the military or private or the government of Guam, what can what can the what can be done to make sure that there aren't more uh, burials that are possibly bulldozed over, artifacts that are lost? What, in your recommendation, can we do to improve this? We need more participation as advocates for preserving the island's heritage. Uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, the massive turnout of the people along Route 15 to protest Poggett stopped that. Unfortunately, the military decided they had to have their firing range and went elsewhere. We need to pressure our elected officials to become advocates, not only elected officials, and I know I've been very critical of the State Historic Preservation Office. They need to be our advocates. Under federal law, they're supposed to have a public participation program. They do not have a public participation program. Uh, I do not see them going out in the community. They should be having programs like this, nor do I even see them on the webpage having any sort of postings of uh, what projects they're reviewing. 
we need to have our historic preservation office an active participation with the community. And doesn't have a conflict of interest either. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. There's a bill languishing in the legislature to uh, to prevent conflicts of interest. And uh, the ship was on military training, military active duty right now. If he's not there to perform his uh, functions as historic preservation officer, then I think that does not help us. Hmm. No, Sidus Masi and Sidus Masi to Dave, Sidus Masi to to Idos Nibasenti, and Ununa Rudy. Two Vinces, one Rudy. Sounds like a, a winning game for a winning hand for poker. <laughs> and so Sidus Masi no Hamzu, thank you so much for joining. And I wanted to thank everyone else who has uh, been tuning in and watching online. This will be available on YouTube sort of uh, this, but it will be archived on Facebook as well for people to tune in. And so put for what, if you haven't, if you have learned a lot today about this, this area of Magua, share the stream, share the video with others to help educate. Because um, unfortunately, we, I think many people nowadays, when they see empty land, they forget that there's a history and a story and there are families that are tied to that land. And so the more stories that we tell, the better we do to educate, the, 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 the more respectful, the stronger steward and more powerful stewards we are of this island, its heritage, its culture, its resources. And so if you enjoyed today's Heat the Talk from the Guam Museum, please share it with others. Um, this is part of our relaunch for 2022. We hope to have Heat the Talks in person soon, uh, depending on the pandemic here on the island. But we have these talks just to connect to the issues that our, that our community is facing. And I really appreciate everyone who joined on the panel and everyone who is watching at home. Enoha para pago. Adios. Este kimanat li hitatlu.